Hey everyone, I'm Seven Investing Lead Advisor, Max Chatsko. I cover biotechnology and renewable energy here at Seven Investing. And uh, as you guys know, I've been filling up some of my, uh, or all of my uh, podcast slots here to talk about synthetic biology. And today I'm joined by a good friend and uh, one of the best blue sky thinkers in synthetic biology, Andrew Hessel. Andrew, how are you doing today? How are the squirrels doing? I'm doing great and the squirrels are running. <laughs> You should probably let them know what that means. No, no, inside joke. Uh, so well, you, let him, you let him know what it means. He, he's got a bunch of different voices in his head. They're all different squirrels, and every day a different one's dominating the discussion and thoughts. Absolutely true. There's about a, I figure there's about a thousand of those squirrels, so it's like I don't worry about one or two voices in my head. That's just that's a, a easy. When it's, when it's a thousand chittering, it makes it more fun. So Andrew, I mean, you're you're involved in all kinds of different things, even just lately. Um, you know, you started a company recently, got that going. Uh, you've been involved in writing human genomes and viral genomes. You've been involved in writing a book. So um, why don't you maybe just give a little introduction? What have you been up to these days? Well, I th you've touched on some major ones. My, my the core that I'm interested in and have been for a long time is how do we write genomes. Um, like how do we, and, and the cool thing is when you write a genome, you're really building an organism. You're going down and, and putting together its operating system. And so I'm kind of fascinated by that end-to-end -end process because I know it starts with the organism that you want to build. Uh, we're, we're really just, we're, today we're really just copying genomes and making small edits. So, so you don't have to have a lot of engineering experience. You just have to start with a, a file of an organism that you're interested in that's been sequenced and you have to try and figure out how to turn it back into the organism and that whole process uh, has only been done uh, for for a handful of organisms today so typically viruses and a few bacteria and but i love it like from starting with that file printing the dna assembling it doing any packaging that you may need to do getting it into, if it's a virus, some sort of cell or cell-free system that can support its replication, or if it's an actual cell, getting that new genome into the living cell, kicking out the genome that's in there, clearly, and you know, you can't have two genomes. Ah, and 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 then grow, you know, seeing if that cell grows and behaves uh, uh, as a digital clone uh, or, or by design, depending on how many changes you may have made. And then, and, and then ultimately validating, testing and measuring whether the virus or the, or the bacteria, the cell, um, the organism is, is doing, is, is what it's supposed to be or doing what it's supposed to do. That entire process to me is just like captivating. Yeah, so um, you know, let's talk about scale a little bit because um, you know, writing a genome that's a lot of base pairs, and typically the edits we're making are you know measured in the not billions well, or millions of base pairs. So, what what does it take? I mean, there's a lot of tools that need to be developed, a lot of processes that need to be developed. Uh, it depends on the genome, obviously. Like it really depends on the genome. So when I was at Autodesk, uh, I joined. I was with Autodesk from 2012 to 2018. I love the company because they essentially make computer aided design tools. And and if there's one thing I know is if you're going to understand biology, you need computer aided tools. Uh, like absolutely, it is complex stuff. A single protein is complex let alone the operation of a cell. So you need computer-aided tools. So I loved being with the company, but I also realized that like, you only really know something if you build it, like if you can build it. It's one thing, it's one thing to use a computer. It's another thing entirely to go and build that computer, um, you know, particularly from, from scratch uh, or build a program from scratch. It, it's it's just necessary. So, so while I was at Autodesk, I figured I have to teach them how to write genomes because it's kind of, we had the design tools, we needed the printer, we needed some way to take that design file and turn it forward. But we don't really know what to design with biology. That takes some real brains, choosing what to design and what changes to make. But just copying a genome is easy. We've got we've got databases that are mushrooming with new 
genome information because scientists around the world are sequencing more and more. Citizens around the world are sequencing more and more. So all of that's just flooding into this database. But you have kind of have to size sort because today our DNA printing technology is still really bad. It's, 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 not, it, it's amazing, but it's also very, it's like first generation. When I think of it in terms of the electronics industry, it, it's, it's when we, we still had individual components, but now they were soldered onto a circuit board. They hadn't yet integrated into chips. We're still super early days. We're building circuits. Uh, and and our machinery is still very early days. It's 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 um, it works and it works pretty well. But but to try and build a viral genome uh, of of let's just put it in the range of five thousand base pairs to several hundred thousand base pairs, we can only work at the low end of that scale really efficiently, and and to do it in any type of volume. So, so right now, 10K is kind of the sweet spot for high throughput stuff, maybe 20, uh, it's kind of pushing it. But if you can start doing that, if, so there's lots of genomes in that range. So if you can, you can literally print out the whole genome of a virus, this is what we did while we were at Autodesk, it was called Phi X174. We were working with this amazing scientist and from Drew Endy's lab, I believe you've had Drew on this podcast, that, that had built Phi X174 from scratch, he, it was his it was his baby to really take this synthetic genome and the understanding of the virus forward. And, and we worked with him and we basically built our first synthetic bacterium or virus. And, and it was like, whoa, this is cool. And then, we, and, then, and then we took that forward and did it with a robot with, with transcriptic, like be, to show that we could deliver DNA and had robots do the lab manipulations and come out with a virus which is like super cool. Anyway, and, and today you can do that similar process for more and more organisms sorted by genome size because the, the limiting factor is not design tools because we're just copying what nature, we're using what nature has provided as a template. But so there's no very little design, but any design is kind of how do you make the process work? And, and um and then you can start building larger and larger genomes. So this is what I see happening today. And we've made, call it a hundred viruses. There might be more, but, but it's, there's no central data bank where you just upload synthetic constructs. Um, and, and we're moving into, uh, there's been several cells, bacterial cells, uh, um, engineered from scratch. Probably the most significant to a wide audience is just E. coli, the, the, the main one we've used in labs, and it's the main constituent of our guts, uh, a, a, a group at, at, uh, in the UK synthesized the E. coli genome and booted that up two years ago in 2019. Um, and now as we get better and better DNA printers, and well, just think of it as robots. It's kind of a black box, DNA printer and manipulation, cell manipulation done by robots in, in call it a lab, call it a box, call it a chip. It doesn't really matter um, that when you, uh, as we get those devices, um, we're just going to start and they get cheaper and faster and, and uh, more accessible, more reliable. We essentially now have printers for, for organisms. <laughs> and it's just like, wow, uh, I don't know why, you know, just people aren't flooding into this field literally every day. <laughs> yeah, well, so just to fill in a few things there. So, you know, for the viral genomes, we're talking about, you know, measuring those in thousands of, of base pairs, base maybe pairs yeah. tens of thousands. The human genome, by comparison, is, I think, 3.2 billion base pairs. Yeah, um, give or take, yeah. Right. And but, so but, that, that gives you an idea of the scale, though. And to be clear, there's some bacteria that have larger genomes than the human genome. So it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the complexity of the organism. But uh, well, well, I, I, I'm not aware of bacteria that have bigger ones than that. But I, I could be wrong. But, but many plants have yeah, right. massive genomes multiple times. And, and we, look, we haven't even come close to scratching the surface of genome prospecting on this planet. Like, I want to be clear, like, the, if you want a job that is fun and interesting, um, 
and you like to travel and explore, and you can do this in kind of every country, uh, go and start looking for interesting organisms and, and don't hurt them or anything, but just get small samples. Um, you don't need the whole organism. You need like the tiniest fraction of that organism and just start putting that in labeled tubes and, and like, because there are a lot of really important genomes out there. <laughs> like it's, it's, it's nature's code base. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's come back to that. Cause there's actually, I think a company or a project that was working on that. But before we do, um, I want to make it very clear. So when you're engineering synthetic viruses, that's for a beneficial purpose. I think we got to make that clear. To okay. People. So well, why uh, are we? Why are yeah. you making synthetic viral genomes? What is the application there? I think that's very important. Uh, yeah. So so again, while I was at Autodesk, uh, the I was trying to advance this goal of just being able to take a digital file and turn it into the real world object. And it's like 3D printing. But the difference with what I was focused on is that real world object would be an organism. Um, and I'm not really partial to any organism. It's just, I had to start with viruses because they have the smallest genomes and we're kind of limited by our genome assembly technologies. So, so that was great. Um, we built Phyx, which, by the you know, is a virus that infects bacteria. It's harmless. You could take Phyx and spread it on toast and, and eat it. And if anyone wants me to demonstrate that, I will. Um, but the, you know, it's not really a, it's a really useful virus in research. It's not really useful in practical day to day. Like it's not going to be a gene therapy. So it was really just to demonstrate that it could be done and that it was safe. And it was really about building the process. Then I started to get, well, how, then I started to get more interested in how do we go and do this for more useful viruses? How do we do it for more sophisticated things? And th this was around 2015, because we booted up the, we booted up the PHYX in 2014. Um, and, and in 2015, I started, I started really nudging, um, uh, folks to think about, let's build a bigger genome. Let's, maybe it's time for a whole new genome project to build a better genome, a bigger genome, so we can start working on these tools kind of from the top down, or at least really start creating the tide that raises all ships. And, and um, I was really fortunate to get together with Nancy Kelly, uh, who's put together big giant bio projects on the East Coast, um, uh, George Church, uh, who's, you know, really one of an icon in genomics now with incredible gravity and, and capability. Um, and, and Jeff Buka, who was uh, a scientist at NYU, formerly from Johns Hopkins, who had really organized uh, folks to write the genome of yeast, which is, um, you know, the same yeast we use in bread and beer, uh, uh, Saccharomyces, but yeast is about a billion years more evolved than a bacterium. Genomes size-wise, it's about three times the size of an E. coli. Uh, it's about, uh, you know, it's 12, 13, 14 million base pairs. It, 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 there's some range, but there's the really important thing is yeast genome is so much more advanced than a bacterium. It's actually, it's actually very similar to our own genome. Yeast is closer to human than it is to E. coli. So it's a big step up the evolutionary tree. It's a eukaryote. It has its true nucleus. Its, its cellular structure is very similar to, to our own. So yeast is kind of the power organism for understanding and, and doing fast research and complex research on, 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 a, on a eukaryote cell. Anyway, we got this team together. We ended up launching the Human Genome Project right. Um, writing a paper with, uh, I think there were 25 scientists listed on it, or started organizing the meeting. Um, and I love this organization because it's basically the group of people that are going to, if not build the future, be, uh, be ground zero for, you know, for talking about this, this growing engineered future um, where we build life the organisms and again we're talking single cell right now but as you point out when we start to get to the gigabase size genome printing capability now we're talking now we're talking plants animals and people and one day dragons and unicorns i imagine but you know <laughs> but but to go from to go from writing uh, uh yeast at around 10 million base pairs give or take um, and, uh, you know, to being able to write 
a billion base pairs. It's going to take a while. Thankfully, there's a lot of organisms in that range, you know, that that are economically useful that should keep propelling our DNA synthesis and assembly forward. Well, I look forward to getting a pet dragon in the mail from you in about uh, 10 to 15 years. How's that sound? Well, I, the printers might be capable of building a drag. I don't think we have the design tools yet. I'll be at a beta tester or something. We'll figure <laughs> it out. Um, so yeah, we mentioned like just to put uh, some numbers on it too. If people are yeah. listening to this mostly. Um, you know, kilobase is a thousand. Uh, megabase would be a million, and then a gigabase would be a billion. Billion base. Uh, just base. to give you a, a sense yeah. of the scale there. And so, you know, so we're like three gigabases, <laughs> give or take. But I, you have to realize just how little digital data that is. Like, oh, yeah. like today, a, a gigabase is a gigabit because it's a bit is a base, whereas we use bytes in computers. Like that's eight bits. Um, like it's actually not that much, you know, information. So, so I absolutely know we're going to have printers at that capability. It's just a matter of building them getting a little creative. Yeah, it's interesting to see how the evolution of tools, even just in the last like 10 years or so, right? I mean, um, you know, in 2010, companies that started in industrial biotechnology, they had to do the whole thing themselves. They needed to own the whole technology stack, R&D and scale up and uh, lab scale, pilot scale, demo scale, commercial scale, and a lot of them didn't make it. And now we have more, now we have more specialization. So there's companies you can... You can go and, hey, I'm going to partner with Transcriptic. They're going to automate my lab processes so my scientists have more time to actually think about stuff. They're not just moving around small volumes of liquid. Uh, so that's an uh, example of you know, specialization. Now you can also you know, partner off your scale-up and commercial activities as well. I would argue you, that's part of the technology stack. I think most people are getting wrong. I think you do need to own uh, your scale-up and your commercial scale reactors, but uh, we'll be figuring that out here shortly if we haven't already. Um, but yeah, yeah, I so- think it depends on the application next. Like, like um, you kind of do a segue into a couple of things. Oh, by the way, just one small correction. Transcriptic uh, uh, um, merged with a company called 3Scan. They formed a new entity called uh, um, Stratios. Um, and they're amazing. Like, so I just, if you're interested in kind of these robotic laboratories, definitely check out Stratios and, and Emerald Cloud Lab. And, and I, those are the ones that kind of stand out, but there's gonna be more because these cloud labs are essentially um, um, factories or what, we, what we've what we been calling in biology foundries, um, really. And, and you know, kind of like a steel foundry, um, stamping out all these different new parts, you know, to go and build a new industry. So I think foundries, are going to be really crucial moving forward. Um, and, and thankfully, Paul Fremont in the UK, Professor Paul Fremont started to organize these biofoundries, academic ones anyway, into a, into a consortium so they can start to synergize and network because they're all kind of doing the same thing. Um, but essentially the heart of Ginkgo is a foundry, the heart of Zymergen is a foundry and the heart of many new, uh, the heart of my own company which I created after I left Autodesk and is, is it was called Humane Genomics, is the heart of it is a foundry. In, in that case, with Humane, it's, it's making the synthetic viruses that we can now engineer and program to fight cancer. But, but foundries are gonna be pretty important. Um, and right now, again, I just tend to, unless you have really specialized knowledge in foundries and those processes, you, it's it's almost easier to think of them as a black box or a microchip, just or a macrochip. You know, the, their process. They're, you don't really know, need to know everything that's going on inside of it. Just like I don't need to know everything that's going on inside my computer monitor to see you and have a conversation with you. What what's important is that they're really standardized and they have a easy to use interface. So if you, for example, in my view, doing something like booting up. Uh, uh, Phi X174 or E. coli should be something my six year old should be able to do because she should, it should really be a nice interface. She should be able to see the organism that she wants clearly and just drag it onto the desktop and, and hit print. And, and all of the processes and money and every, all the transactions necessary to, to go and do that with a robot should be seamless and, and to her. 
Um, and at the end of the day, she should get her validated organism, you know, and if she needs it in the real world, obviously she needs to be properly permitted. My six-year-old is not. Um, but if, if, if she, if the robot can do testing and measurement as well, then it's really just going to get handed off to the next robot, which she'd have to program, which is, you know, you know, whatever validation she needed or measurements she had to do to test like a new growth medium, for example, you know, with, I'm not talking even modifying that organism. That's just drag and drop stock E. coli. But then just as easily, you could go and take another organism that's in the library that's heavily modified and drag and drop that and, and do really groundbreaking experiments or research or product development all within that foundry, all using a very simple interface, all super secure because it never leaves the, the black box. And it's completely reproducible by anyone else that wants to validate the work. Plus it has all the data logs, et cetera. Like foundries are the so much better than any academic or, or even than most, and even most industry labs because it removes all the bench cooking and turns it into a robotic procedure that is now universally accessible. Uh, and, and you just don't have to worry about that level of abstraction anymore. And I love it. And I know that's going to catch on and it's going to be important for my daughter. It's going to be important for my son. It's going to be important for Africa. I've got to do a Synbio Africa presentation tomorrow night. And, and I'm tr I, I, part of my presentation is Africa doesn't have to go through that small step where you have to learn how to scale and do all, you know, all these steps and build labs and have all these tools. The most important thing you can do is have a relationship with a foundry. Build your own foundry if you can, absolutely. But have a relationship with a foundry and start getting people in front of computers and teaching them design. In other words, leapfrog a lot of the development that we've had to do here for the last 20 years. It's interesting. I, uh, you know, I've judged iGEM in the past, the iGEM competition, and there's teams from Africa, right, every year. And relative to the amount of infrastructure they have in those countries and then what they can do with biology, even today when like, you know, 2020 technology and tools, it's pretty impressive. And a lot of it hits on that standardization that you're talking about. You know, you can design things on a computer. Now um, we can have digital biology. You can outsource things to, you know, um, a lab that's running, you know, open trans robots or whatever it is. Um, so all very interesting and uh, it's such an exciting time, you know, all this stuff's going to really take off. Uh, it's still pretty early though. Um, it is, but, and, and so, the, like, you can see it in the foundry community in particular, in particular, um, uh, you know, Paul Fremont's organization has roughly 30, maybe it's grown to 40 foundries, you know, but they're all, but they're all cellular, like, they, it's not like they all started to pop up and build on a standardized system, they've all kind of did their own thing, and now they're coming to the table, um, so, but I, I, what I foresee happening, because the low level machinery in the cell, I mean all cells, plant, animal, you, me, it doesn't matter, bacteria, the low level machinery in that cell is universal. You know, we, we have DNA as the universal storage molecule for information, except for viruses, right? So we have, we have the polymerase enzymes that copy that DNA and make duplicates. And, and we have from there, the RNA polymerase that reads portions of that of that of that DNA and turns it into RNA, which is like the working copy to go in into the cellular machinery, which is the next step with the ribosome. The ribosome is like the ultimate 3D printer for all biomolecules. So it, it reads the mRNA and makes whatever it's it needs to make. Um, or the machine that needs to make the more complex thing that the ribosome itself can't make. So I love this low level system. It's, it's so easy to understand that you can teach it to a six-year-old. And, um, and the, even though the, it gets much, much more complex, more complex than any human can keep into their heads, that's you know, a separate point. AI will win this game. But it, it's just so universal that as we, start to, as we start to better understand and package this process, it's going to, it's going to become, it's going to grow really quickly. Because for example, even with all the virus stuff that we're doing today, we don't have to, we don't have to do that in a cell. We can design the DNA of the virus genome and we just have to put it into a tube with the appropriate machinery to turn 
those, the, that virus genome into the proteins and nucleic acids that get packaged into a particle. But you don't need a cell to do that. You just need some of the cellular components to do it. Um, so that's really fascinating. Same thing with the mRNA vaccines for COVID. Like those aren't made in, in uh, a living cell or an egg like we used to make the old vaccines. It's just made in, in bioreactors. But the coolest thing is the biggest bioreactor, the biggest scale up is really our own bodies with the COVID vaccine. Like we are a biomanufacturing plant. And so as we get better at programming cells, or writing just programs that our own cells can, can deal with. Like, I think that, again, there's an opportunity to leapfrog. You don't have to go and, you know, and scale it on a lab bench and scale it to, you know, a bigger fermenter and then ultimately into, you know, a bigger fermenter and then ultimately into giant, giant fermenters like they use for making beer, which are massive, by the way. Those are probably the biggest fermenters I've ever seen. Um, and, and, like you just don't have to do that process because depending on the molecule, you want to make a new beer, yeah, new milk, yeah, you got to have that capacity. But but you know, so if you're making some sort of food product, yeah. But if you're just making medicines or very high value cost per gram stuff, um, you know, vaccines, medicines, some other designs, uh, no, you just need you just need you know have to have control over the the, the programming process. Yeah. So. That's a good point. Uh, yeah. Biologic drug products are usually produced at like in the low thousand, 1000 liter scales. Um, some specialty ingredients for industrial biotech, maybe like 50,000 to 100,000 liters. And then it goes way higher than that. I mean, I think lactic acid fermentation, that's a food ingredient. It's like up to a million, I think, 1 million liters. Um, so yeah, the, the ingredient matters for where you're, what you're trying to do there and, and how that works. Go check out a big giant brewery like Anheuser Busch or Carlsberg or Heineken. Like these, they're massive, but they're basically just biofermenters. They're they're growing yeast, and and you know your you know beer is essentially waste excretions from yeast. But but um, yeah, those are really fun. I also think we're going to get a whole bunch of microbreweries because as you know for over a decade now, people have been programming, you know, the whole idea of putting really important drugs into yeast as expression. Um, you know, people talk about golden yeast instead of golden rice, uh, you know, fortified beers of all sorts of different types, soon <laughs> psychoactive beers, perhaps like, you know, much more psychoactive than just alcohol. Um, you know, I can see depression fighting beers coming along. I can see, you know, intelligence enhancing beers coming along. All of these are just going to be like little you know, microbreweries popping up around the world. Well, that's interesting too, because, you know, that's the old way of doing it. Maybe still the current way of doing it is to get the economies of scale. You need these giant fermenters, but you know, wouldn't, I've always thought like distributed fermentation kind of works a little better, right? If you could, if every city had a, a brewery or a industrial biotech facility, and then you could just pour it over the instructions and you wouldn't need massive scales, right? If you could produce things more locally. Oh, I think that's the way it's going. Like, I love the, I love these uh, companies like Plenty and Aero Farms that are starting to put giant farms right in the heart of cities um, and, and optimizing them, uh, you know, so the outputs are amazing and, and efficient. Um, we're starting to see container farms come in under, uh, either on the roofs or underneath uh, certain restaurants now, because they're starting to own more and more of the actual food chain uh, you know, for, for really, you know, particularly if they're high-end precision foods. And so I think there's going to be kind of a, I think there should be some sort of Michelin star equivalent rating of some of these more, um, it's not, you know, I think they're, it's just really creative uh, food science. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. Like, I can't wait till I just go to a bio food conference and, and it's really just a giant, you know, dim sum. <laughs> uh, that would i can't wait for that i also think there should be a uh, like an incubator where there's the companies making like cell-based proteins and, and foods and then like also a restaurant so you can they can actually like well, try out ideas like yeah of course no like uh, look if it's not tasty and yummy and people are willing to pay a premium for it just to experience it and and ultimately start to recognize the other benefits than just calories because again we get to build 
the cells that make up meat, for example, or the or the yeast that make dairy products now, uh, like with Perfect Day, we we get we get full control over the design of that organism if we have genome writing capability. Like so, we can tweak that organism, you know, for whatever features we want. And I think I think the uh, B, the one of the leaders at BGI, you know, said it really well. Like if it's you know. At, at some point when it comes to animals, like if, it, if it's tasty, sequence it. Because now you've got basically the program of that, of that organism that's tasty to eat, you know, that you can now start using in other constructs, in other ways. And, and I love this idea that, I, I love this idea that moving forward, we can have cruelty-free meat, that we could have, cru you know, that we could have cruelty-free dairy. Uh, and, and I don't mean I don't mean cruel in in the cruelest sense. Sometimes, like uh, even today, uh, some more and more of our practices with agriculture are becoming more humane. I, I I see that progress, but I also realize we just have less and less need to actually raise the animal uh, or or use it as part of an industrial process um, to feed humanity. Like, uh, it's going to take generations to shift because there's so many of us. It's hard to imagine, you know, like if you have one chicken a week, <laughs> you know, like that's a lot of chickens <laughs> and just, we, it's hard to imagine that, that scale, but we, it, it's hard to imagine that where electronics is now compared to was, where it was 40 years ago. And the cool thing about biology is once you've got the program, once you've got it going, it scales relatively effortlessly. It can be distributed relatively effortlessly. Um, and, and yeah, and so I, I, think we have, I think we have the potential to see all of biotech and bioengineering move forward faster than any other technology we've ever had altogether. Like even with computers, we were limited to how quickly we could develop new computer technology, build the fabs, figure out what to design and make in those fabs and you know, the chips essentially to go and build our digital future. All of that had you know, a, a 10 to 20 year strategy attached to it and funding required to kind of keep it moving forward, typically around 10 years. But, but, and it's great that it continued to accelerate, but all of, bioengineering, once you've got genome writing kind of down and cell engineering, basic cell engineering kind of down, it's limited by software, the speed at which you can develop new software and, and do the actual programming. And so I think we're going to get better and better and faster and faster at that, particularly because we've been making such tremendous progress with things like protein folding. Um, and just taking a string of amino acids and, and literally computationally getting the fold. And now as we start to layer on the, the com computation that understands the functions of these folds, now we start to kind of move into really rapid protein design for, you know, so I think it's just going to be a blast. I, I wish I was 18 years old today and learning from the best bioengineers and roboticists and everything and, and having the chance to join a foundry like Ginkgo. Or, or build my own foundry for whatever I want to do, because it's like, whoa, what a, what a, there's never been a better time to be bioengineer, in my opinion. Yeah, I think, uh, so I was talking with um, uh, Dan from uh, Bolt Threads on the podcast too, and he was saying, you know, one of the limitations is actually, uh, you know, how, how much, how, how far outside the box we can think. You know, he's like, we can design things that, you know, materials that aren't used in ways they are today. But customers just want, they see like, how can we replace leather? How can we replace, you know, this, uh, you know, polymer? They're not really thinking outside the box. So uh, that might also be a limitation. I think our, our uh, what we can do, our capabilities will advance faster than like maybe uh, how quickly we are using them, right? To, to... Well, well, and in some ways, yeah. Well, but Moore's law itself was an economic, was, was braked by economics, not how quickly we could develop chips. It was how quickly we could, bring chips that were useful into the marketplace. And, and so that was a slower process, but, but I, I see, so, you know, I've thought a lot about this because I see the potential for our ideas and our bio needs to, you know, to actually advance faster, advance faster than our ability to, to translate these things into the market. 
Um, so, but that that resonates really closely with me with the PC revolution, because there was a time when when literally the mainframe builders just didn't see any reason for PCs at all. Uh, who would ever need one? And and you know the reality was when you put that capability even as a toy into the hands of people, they found ways to use it usefully. And and of course the future you know happened. Like it, it's. You can't put that computational genie back into a box anymore. It's it's completely out there. I think the same thing is going to happen with um, with the with with synthetic biology, with this process of just being able to sit down at a computer and and either just drag and drop and print an organism, an orchid for your garden, um, uh, uh, a yeast for a medicine. Um, I think that's just going to become something that people start to use and it doesn't take anything more than a little bit of digital familiarity in a credit card you know uh, like all the all the tough stuff is kind of baked into that process and then i think people once they understand and trust that process will start to design and build more sophisticated things and i think again that foundry model standardizes it keeps all the records applies for all the permits it's smart it's a foundries are smart and and people start to play with this and then the limitation in actually moving this to market is just is just some of the, is, is utilization. And so I think I wrote I wrote a piece that for the book it didn't make it in, but it was I'm going to have to write another essay on it. But I see the rise of biohackers as as being really important for the for the mushrooming of this technology because there may not be a market for something but if you can make something for ten dollars that's really sophisticated and meets even your own personal need you're going to want to do it but you might be the only person that this program is suitable for um, and the only way you're ever going to know if it works or not is to actually go and do it now we're going to have a lot of experience programming yeast and bacteria and other things. I, I get that, but when it comes to things like, oh, I, I'm blind in, in my left eye or or both my eyes, whatever, and I want to try and fix it, the only the only person that is going to be able to get that fix is 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 the blind person. It, cancer is the one I usually speak about because. We, as you know, so many people get cancer. It's this this wide panoply of this spectrum of diseases, and our treatments are still very crude. Like the basic treatment is kill all the fast growing cells. Well, okay, we target it a little bit more now. We have a few molecules to really target specific populations, but it's not like it hasn't gotten to the point where we can cure everyone with cancer. And we know that we can design really, really specific antibiotics for cancer cells using the same technologies that have now become cheap. Make a protein, make an antibody, make a, uh, an mRNA, uh, use a CRISPR construct to clip out and kill a, a section of the can, you know, kill the cancer cell with, with specificity. And we've got more and more delivery vehicles for getting those programs to the cancer cells or molecules to the cancer cells, whether it's a lipid nanoparticle, a synthetic virus capsid, a re-engineered virus. You know, like now we've got delivery systems that are also cheap. So if you can build your own cancer therapy for, you know, all in, let's just call it a thousand dollars, and it's tailored to you. Uh, I think depending on you know how sick you are, you do the rest risk benefit for yourself. You go. There's no money. There's no money. There's no way you can build a clinical trial around that in the way we typically do it. And there's no profit in that. If anything, the only real value, uh, you know, besides the personal value of oh maybe this will actually treat my cancer, and I think they will. By the way. Um, but the real the real value is that is understanding this this is having this process really efficient and affordable and the incredible knowledge that you're getting now between here are my designs and here are my outputs like this act this design actually killed that cell very specifically it didn't have a lot of you know off target effects you know which we look at as you know which we which we know for chemo are pretty bad. Um, and, and we just get better and better at refining those programs. And I think wrap a big AI box around that and it becomes, you know, I can see a future not so far away where you can basically treat every cancer 
for an incredibly low price. And I've been telling pharma companies this for years, like enjoy getting $2 million for your gene therapy. That's not going to last long. Enjoy being able to sell your cancer drugs at a high price because that's not going to last long because one size fits all doesn't work for cancer. And the ability to almost algorithmically make a cancer treatment is, is coming online. Like, like, Take, I can I can envision a black box boundary, whatever, where you where you just take a biopsy that a doctor has taken from a cancer and you just drop it in and literally gets processed and broken down into individual cells. Each of those cells get individually sequenced, the whole, whether it's normal or cancerous or you know, a mixture of cells, and all that information feeds into a design engine and and literally you you go and make a custom formulation that you know if you add it back to that same population of cells that you just sequenced you know selectively knocks them out like that whole process is just could all be computer controlled and when we have that it's like the limiting factor to treating any cancer or even micro is is just getting a sample yeah you do see this evolution of tools so there's actually one at least uh, oncolytic virus approved by the fda um it's called tvec it's from yeah. amgen yeah 2015 i well no no it was a little later um but yeah 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 so there's there's some limitations to that i think that has to be like directly injected into the tumor which is a um uh, somewhat difficult sometimes oh, it's yeah. for melanoma yeah. but yeah well, we're getting it's, better it's, at it's amazing because it opened the door yeah it opened the door but but here's the thing one size fits all doesn't work for any cancer so, so this is why, uh, and, and, and the problem with the clinical trial systems that we have today for something like TVEC is you have to lock in your design. You have to lock it in and you can't change it, you know, for the next patient. So, so it, it just kind of forces you into a really narrow spectrum of who you can treat. Whereas if you can unlock uh, the process and keep it more individualized, um, uh, that's when you really start getting more effective treatments. Yeah, you're right. So, um, you know, it, I think we'll, we're going to run into this problem and this will be exposed more publicly with some of those mRNA vaccines for cancer. So BioNTech has already tested one for melanoma. I don't know why everyone's going after melanoma with all these things, but, uh, um, so they just had four, I think, antigens in their, you know, mRNA vaccine and some people responded very well, some didn't respond at all. And it's kind of getting to your point where, um, you know, even though you put four antigens in there to, to train people's immune system for, yeah, that's not going to work for everybody. We need more individualized, more personalized medicine. And with mRNA, you can actually do that. But due to how clinical trials are regulated and designed, it's not possible. So well, this is uh, like I, I first heard the, the CEO of, of Moderna speak at an exponential medicine um, conference, the Daniel Kraft's conference down in, in uh, Coronado. And, and I, he, his talk was brilliant, in my opinion, because what he really just demonstrated to me, he said, uh, as part of the talk, as I recall it, we can actually design and validate a new medicine in, in weeks. This was, this was four or five years ago. And he says, in weeks. And, and, uh, but it takes so long to go through the, the process of, of getting it to market that we have to partner with big drug companies. You know, like it just, it, very high barriers. Like people don't, you know, people who fear uh, biotech really don't appreciate just how conservative we are in the entire industry and how safety is the biggest priority. And to the point where it's kind of ridiculous because if you have people dying because they can't get treatment, you know, while you're trying to prove safety, your, your risk and benefit you know, variables might need a little bit of tuning. But that being said, it's, we're, you know, this is why mRNA vaccines coming out this year was such a big game changer, in my opinion, for the entire field of synthetic biology. Because this was, first of all, it demonstrated in Moderna's case that it didn't take them six weeks to design a new medicine now and validate it. Um, uh, like, uh, it took them 24, uh, 48 hours to design it. And, and just going to manufacture it for lab use would have been two weeks. Um, but they made the gutsy decision to go take it all the way to clinical grade so they could go to clinical use on spec because this was early. But, but I think now that 
but that's a first generation mRNA. Now it's going to get so much, that process will iterate and improve too. Yeah, we're seeing this more and more too with genetic medicines because they are programmable and they are specific and they are selective. So like one example that I like, and this is validated clinically is uh, with alnylam pharmaceuticals. So they're using RNA interference, but the probability of success for their liver targeted payloads is almost 60%. So the wow. entire industry-wide average, so that means the chances of a clinical candidate for in phase one getting to market is 60%. Uh, wow. For the whole market, for all the drug industry, um, it's only 7.9%. So imagine like, you know, I think we're going to see this with like gene editing eventually. Like there's going to be ways we figure out how to constrain those risks and have reproducible results. And, you know, it's not going to be a hundred percent, but I think we're going to have very high probabilities of success, mRNA, uh, some of these other tools, these other oligo tools. So I wonder if that will make uh, it easier for the FDA to maybe, you know, accelerate some of these trials or what do they allow? Like, you know, oh, you're using the same contract you use that's on the market and 10 other drugs. Okay. Like we're not even going to, to worry about that. Now biology is so complex. So I don't know. I mean, yeah, no, like and that, the complexity of biology is a problem and the, and the, the fact that we're all different. Um, but, but, you know, there's, but, you know, treating a human for a sickness or, or, an error, life and death, situation, just treating a human, even if it's not life and death, um, just putting anything into a human, it could be a food, it could be some topical cream, doing any manipulations on a human, it just has this super high bar. Um, this is where if you want to man do experiment on yourself, you're welcome. Hey, you want to climb a mountain, risk your life, fly a helicopter, you want to, you want to take that pill at a party, you know, and so someone puts in your hand and says, you'll love that. Like we all do our own risk and benefit. I, I told you that. Time. I told you that in confidence. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's another, that's a whole other line that we don't talk about enough right now, but I think was coming online. Like one of the hardest organs to treat in the human body is the brain. And, and I think like, I, I, I love my strange brain. Like for me being neurodiversity is something that I think we need to cherish and talk about more, but, but I, I describe myself as OC no D because it's a feature, not a bug. Uh, like I love my squirrels. They're my power animal, but the, but we don't talk about that. Like if you don't fit in, our, our society has kind of evolved over the, in, here in the West for the last while. If you don't fit this kind of module and you have this definition of your position and these are your skills and they're provable and you're reliable and all this, like you just don't get work, like standardized work because everything's kind of standardized. Um, even the process of getting that job is kind of standardized. And it's like, ah, um, I, I don't fit into any of those categories. And, and you know, the, you know we, we have to recognize that neural programming is also going to come online. Because just as we can manipulate a cell to either turn off if it's cancerous or be repaired if it's broken or in or fortified if it needs it. For example, I, if I was an astronaut, I'd really want to fortify my DNA repair systems in every cell, just because of the radiation background. You know, um, you know, like if we can't do that, as well as start, um, you know, opening up this field of technology to younger kids, so that you know, dem like create safe play spaces. Um, which I think is going to be really important. We have it in computers because you, you know, kids start to learn to code or build circuits, you know, from the, you know, three, age three these days. And, and ultimately by the time you get to Arduinos, you're, you're taking over the house. But, you know, like, I think that's really important, but the, the this, we have to talk about we're, we're going to start programming the mind. Like autism, I, I'm fascinated by autism. We have like, but I, I don't have enough biological data. I've just got this, I just have stories uh, and, and kind of macroscopic. I, I want sequences. I want proteomics. I want, I need to understand what's going on in the brain um, before I understand. I want to know what's causing it because apparently it's an epidemic. Uh, depression. Okay. I get, I get that. Thankfully, I don't fall into depression, but people that do, how do you get out of that? And when you see the antidepressants with a side effect on the, you know, from the FDA, may cause depression. It's like, ooh, maybe this needs a little more work, um, in my opinion. 
uh, and then there's just the fact that, you know, when we like to get dizzy. So when we're not working or sick, we like to go out and get a little dizzy uh, and, and perhaps, you know, play with our sensorium a bit. Um, uh, I had the pleasure 20 years of going to, going to some raves and it's like, whoa, okay. I kind of wish I discovered this a little earlier, um, but, but yeah, it's, um, uh, that's coming. So I, one of the one of the groups that I'm just totally in love with, and it's it's brand new. It just went through Y Combinator this this uh, this last summer, along with the Virus Engineering Company. By the way, my virus. The, I'm just an advisor now. We've got a great team. They're moving it forward. But Humane Genomics was in Y Combinator, so cancer fighting viruses will keep coming and evolving. Yay! But also a company called Mind State Design. Uh, went through it, and these uh, formerly Kaikion, um, they rebranded during the process. But I love these guys because they're starting to integrate um, uh, just this incredible library of of psychoactive molecules. It's massive, and and um, the what happens to those molecules when it gets into the brain? What essentially the neuron, the cycle, like all the signaling pathways that that these molecules hit and, and quantify, all that's getting done. And it's being essentially all uh, connected to um, uh, natural language reports of, of experience with these molecules, essentially trip reports, people's experience with that. And the whole thing is being put into an AI system for, for processing, design. And, and Today, it's really, it's really hard to advance these things forward. It's really slow. You have to prove it out in very careful steps. But the future of that is you start to see it blossom because everyone's mind is unique. Um, I think it just opens up this incredible future for us in terms of mental health. But by the way, I should back up. I should, for me, my, the way I talk about the brain is reality, it's a music studio. Just like the, you can, most people have an idea of a music studio in their head. The band is in a soundproof room and then there's a big giant mixing board with a sound engineer that can basically make that band sound like crap or sweet, sweet music just by filters. And so every single one of us, reality is in the studio. We all experience kind of a consensus reality, but we all have our own mixing board and we turn down, like some of it's set naturally, genomics, but, but others we, we, we train um, and, and set certain filters. I know some people that can walk through a forest and identify every plant. I can identify brown and green. Uh, I know I, I, I can empathize with molecules. Most people have no freaking clue what I'm talking about. Some people have super sensitive hearing, et cetera. I love all this sensory and neurodiversity, but it's, it's so unique, but it's all these filters. And what I learned is the psychoactive molecules, all they do is change the settings on the mixing board. And, and so it can create new mind states. And if your mixing board is broken, like you've got all sorts of things up at 10 and a bunch at zero, and you're in kind of really an off balance state, I think some of these molecules, as we get precision, are really going to, you know, both in measurement and design, I think we're gonna to start to rebalance them. And it's, it's really good because we're all human. Our core motivations are really low level. Our, the way we process things, particularly in a world where information is exploding, is getting harder and harder to do. And, and, um, and it's not slowing down. So I don't think we all need to have electrodes in our head to be happy, like, you know, for some people, neural links are going to be really, really important because if you don't have direct control of talking to your limbs, neural link is going to be really good. And as the gamers have pointed out, uh, it's going to be so much better than, you know, thumbs. But uh, I think that just being able to um, be mentally healthy and, and happy and functional and fearless and, and not, uh, and not uh, anxious about whether it's COVID or death or, or just life, I think this is going to be really, really important moving forward. I agree with so much of this. And, you know, we have really good data already on psychedelics and mental health, you know, and again, like that's kind of more of a regulatory issue. And there's a lot we don't understand in the precision of it. 
which again, like you've pointed out, there's, there's companies and, and scientists working on that, but well, I think yeah. we have to. I think we have to thank ravers everywhere for doing the clinical <laughs> trial on safety and dosing, um, and now we just have to learn how to use these molecules with precision. Um, because, like, this is why it's it's amazing to see that you know psilocybin and mushrooms are are being you know just incredibly effective in dealing with with treatment resistant depression. I was just going to bring that up. There's like there's nothing for treatment resistant depression as the name implies. And there's like yeah. some drugs you can take and they, they don't work or they work a little bit or for like a couple of weeks and and then there's like these natural uh natural you know, mushrooms. Like literally they yeah. grow uh, out in nature, you know, and and you can take them and with a pro appropriate supervision, you know, both medically and and psychically, <laughs> psychologically. Um, you know, because this is, it goes into the spirit realm. Well, you have to remember your whole brain, everyone's brain makes a model of the universe of reality that is unique. So, so this can be really, some of the experiences can be challenging when you realize that you can control the mixing board and you can totally change the way inputs and outputs in neural processing goes, whoa, that, that's a big one for for people that haven't played with consensus reality. That, uh, you can play with consensus reality just by spinning. Like it, it's not that hard, but, but, it's, um, but it, it, most people like to think they're in control. Uh, you're not, like it, it's, there's some switches, you have some controls, but, but those systems go pretty deep. Um, but yeah, this, uh, the other one that's really just been making headways is, is MDMA or, you know, uh, common name Molly, but this is, this is becoming so, uh, so powerful in, in terms of dealing with um, uh, PTSD and anxiety and just some of life, life's problems. I remember reading an article, I'm Canadian, I remember reading an article over 20 years ago about how more and more couples were just sitting down in, in, in the comfort of their home and, and taking MDMA and totally opening their relationships again. And it's like, you know, wow. Anyway, I, it's, I love that we're starting to talk about this, that we're starting to understand the biology, the chemistry, and, and ultimately, um, you know, make it something that people can trust, uh, you know, if, if they need, if they need help, where they can get access to it legally, and the right support. Oh, yeah, I agree. So, um, you know, we've mentioned biohackers before, a group I'm also fond of, those crazy SOBs, uh, what role might they have in, in either, you know, psychedelics or moving the field forward in terms of uh, opening the eyes of regulators to, to different pathways to get things in humans? Yeah, well, in a sense, we're all biohackers, right? Like we, we're all biohackers. Um, so this is, I'm, I'm quite serious that we, we almost owe a debt to people that have, um, you know, that have, have been part of the psychedelic development process because, you know, the chemists would make molecules, they kind of, they test on themselves, they test on a local group of friends and, and ultimately uh, record experience um, because you have to unlock the psycho. Um, there's about, just to give you some numbers that, uh, that I know, they may or may not be totally accurate, but, but from what I understand, there's, you can make giant spectrums of these molecules. They're really small molecules, very bioavailable. So there's a whole spectrum of them. I'm not a chemist, but I can empathize with these molecules. And it's, let's just say there's a vast library, but they have to have a biological effect. If you take them and they get into your brain, they have to have something to dock with. It's kind of, molecular systems are kind of lock and key. And so what I understand is there's about 300 different neuroreceptors um, that, these molecules dock with. And I met some people that were mapping the, the docking relationships 20 years ago. Um, and, and there's a whole community that kind of did that work. They had purified drug, they had cloned receptors and they were building receptor binding assay data, data sets which is amazing. Um, and then if you understand the downstream signaling from that receptor into the cellular milieu, which we know really well now because of the genome projects and, and just so much biochemistry being done. Now you have a pretty good understanding from the molecule through what's happening internally, but in, in a cell, but that doesn't tell you about the subjective experience 
of the individual because it's your brain, it's your consciousness, it's your base mental state where your knobs are set on that mixing board that's now being affected. And, and so um, the only way to get that information is to take it, you know? So, so I think we really owe a debt to people that have experimented with this before and started to provide the data in the form of trip reports, et cetera, as well as, you know, teach us about where there is real physiological danger, which is really rare with most of the psychedelics, as I understand, but where there's real physio physiological data, if you take too much, this can happen. You know, if you, if you don't have the right support with this experience, you, this might be a little traumatic in itself, you know, whatever. Um, you know, those, those, those road lines have been discovered and kind of painted by people that have, that have, you know, been, um, you know, that have had past experience. So I, I, I think all of that knowledge is being collected. But at the end of the day, it's your brain. Um, it's your body. And I think the biohackers are going to uh, uh, take um, uh, authority and responsibility for that in a way that, uh, in a way where they basically sign, you know, commit to it. And, and publish that and professionalize and form a community so that, you know, because if you want to always minimize harm and maximize, you know, effect and positive effect. And, and I think working as a community will do that. And today, um, I think they could do that and issue a token <laughs> and make it a blockchain and, and, uh, and be partnering with you know, drug developers and other folks because they're fully consented, they're fully aware um, that, you know, they're the ideal test subjects for personalized medicine. And, and honestly, if it's not safe for any human consumption, the, I think the leaders into personalized medicine uh, for, for, you know, for treatments moving forward are gonna be dogs. And, and because dogs are the closest analogs we have for humans in the real world, they share our world with us and our physiology is very similar and we treat them like our children. We would never want to do anything to cause suffering to a dog, but we would push the boundaries of R&D to alleviate their suffering. So, so I think that dogs are truly going to be, uh, you know, the way forward. And the only scary thing I, I, in that realm for me is that there's some dogs that are already very intelligent and when I was a kid, I had a dog that was more intelligent than my siblings. And so I always thought dogs <laughs> were human level intelligent. Like I always thought that I was, I remember being a little traumatized when, when I realized people don't give equal standing to dogs. Um, and, and I, although that'll come around, I guess one day, but, but a little bit of brain bioengineering into dogs. And I think that you know, like dogs will, will, demonstrate IQ and agency and, and intelligence to the, to the point where, you know, they will be citizens. Maybe that's a little forward thinking, but no, I, I, I don't see any reason why that couldn't happen. Now, don't ask me that about cats. I love cats, but I'm just not sure there's enough brain to work with. <laughs> Ido for president, I can get behind that. But uh, mm. cats, man, they would take over or do something, you know. Well, really that's just it. They would take over the world. Like that scares me more than AI. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> let's bring this a little bit back to Synbio. Um, okay. One of the best ca um, ingredient categories is cannabinoids, right? If we can synthesize yeah. cannabinoids and microbes, I'm sure there's a way to do that with psychoactives as well. Um, sure. I don't know if anyone's really working on that specifically. I don't, uh, I don't know if there's anything public about that, but uh, yeah, that could be an interesting molecule for fermentation as well. Yeah. I, I think it's moving that way. Like I, I, I'm not a farmer. I, I'm not, uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm, we have a small garden. The things that I've grown have generally been single cells. I usually tell people if it's got more than one cell, I'm not interested. <laughs> um, but that being said, uh, uh, just about every single molecule or drug, it's, it can be made in a single cell. And, and so I think, you know, I think we're just going to get some really interesting beers. Um, like, I think that's going to be a lot of it. You can do fermentation at home too. I expect that there will be boxes. And of course, your, your body's a factory too. 
So it could very well, uh, in, in some of my presentations years ago at Singularity University, I just had a, a kind of an injector, like an EpiPen, very simple. Um, but, and I, I kind of just drew a little schematic where it's got a, where it's got a Wi-Fi chip and authentication and then a DNA synthesizer and a little protein expression unit and, and aerosolized jet injector. So there's no needles just, and, and the whole thing is basically a pharmaceutical company and a pen that you can just load a program into and it'll just run it. And I, I, I don't think that's science fiction. Um, I think biofoundries will, you know, become the size of cell phones and then they'll become even more powerful and just become little chips inside cell phones and, and then probably chips in our head too. Um, because yeah, I don't know. Uh, or I don't know. I, I don't, I'm not into invasive things. I've got like one tattoo, but, but, uh, I, but I, I absolutely want to make sure that people have realized that as you move towards personalized medicine, you have to build a relationship with groups that can build things specifically for you and you're the only one that can evaluate them. You know, if it's making your life better, I'd say it's, it's, it's a positive product. You know, if it's making your life worse, you're getting sicker and blah, blah, blah. It, the whole thing is to minimize. But open sharing, I think, is a better model than kind of the siloed pharmaceutical industry. Yeah, that's interesting. And, you know, the pen, the pen idea, the pharmaceutical company in a box or in a pen, it's an interesting idea. And, you know, years ago, you used to talk about, uh, you used to tell me like, um, you know, all the sensors in an iPhone, those used to be way bigger. Those used to be entire science projects or like DARPA or whatever. And now it, you know, fits in your pocket. Yep. And like you said, we're going to have that in buy. Yeah, and Apple's already saying like the earbuds are going to have more and more sensors. Yeah. You know, because they, they pick up a whole bunch of activity. Yeah. There's nothing between you, you know, on either side of your brain. Um, I love that. Uh, like, I think Apple is just going to be, and, and just anyone that makes phones, and apps for phones are just going to become more and more um, part of our health maintenance systems. So one day though, like we'll scale down bio labs. Right now it takes up a room. It's kind of like an old mainframe computer, if you think about it. And one day you think we'll scale it down to much yes. smaller, like a yes. desktop. Oh yeah. No, desktops will be a phase and then eventually it'll be chips. <laughs> and yeah, like, like remember the, the entire living cell uh, you know, the most complex machine on the planet, let's just keep it a simple cell like a bacterium. That's one micrometer by five micrometers. It's basically like a little hot dog, but it's, it's, it, it's a micron level factory that can be programmed to make almost anything. And if you go up to a human cell, now, now you're, you're looking at about a hundred microns. Some of them are bigger, some of them are smaller, but, but, you know, roughly one to 200 microns. And that's, so it's still a micro machine. And, and all of that fits. So, any, so I used to tell uh, my friend, Mark Fisher Colbury, who now runs Stratios, uh, I, when he used to run a company called LabSite that had, was extremely precision liquid metering using sound waves. And, and I said, look, my whole philosophy is if you can see the liquids you're working with in a biological experiment, you've got a million times too much. Like, like everything happens at the nanoscale inside a cell. The, the entire factory is micron scale. And then look at the fabs that we have today and the factories that we have today. Look at the cloud storage systems that we have today. Like these things are giant. The gigafactories at Tesla, these things are giant. You know, that's bio as it gets more sophisticated, gets smaller, you know, because, because biology is already universally scaled globally. You know, you, you don't have to go searching for a cell. You don't have to build the infrastructure to go and build a cell to reprogram. They're just free. They're everywhere. And at the end of the day, you know, geographically, the around the Earth, the the equator, which is you know plus or minus twenty degrees from the equator, which has typically been a lot of developing economies because the the natural world is so rich and fertile in that area, and you don't freeze to death. You don't have to plan really far in the future to survive like we've up in Canada we froze <laughs> all those people that thought they could just wing it over the winter they just they're all icicles somewhere um uh, but but now that power band around the earth just looks to boom it with Symbio that's another you know story I'll tell Symbio Africa it's like oh you got sunlight you got water you got young people you've got you know 
You, and, and you've got no legacy systems to protect. You go build a new pharma company, you're not going to have the old pharma company, you know, trying to sue you in court. Yeah, and we've seen that in other industries too, right? Look at like um, how fintech works in India. They didn't have all these legacy systems. So India has like some pretty advanced fintech. Like everything, you know, your bank account on a phone, you can send money through a text because they didn't have all that legacy yeah. uh, nonsense to work through like we do, where it takes years to get, you know, I mean, you get paid in a bank account, it still takes how many days to settle here in the United States. So oh, it's, it's sad. It, it, it's really, <clears throat> it's depressing. And, and I just ran into that problem a couple of weeks ago because I used <laughs> my particular bank didn't allow ACH transfers, just like the, the interbank transfers. And it's like, you're kidding me. I had to wire money to, a, to another bank. And it took, you know, it took $25 in fees and then two days to clear. You're like, no, this is nuts. This is so, so I, this is why I see so much potential now coming online in places like India and Africa. And because they're kind of starting out from scratch, they need, you know, they need to be lifted up. But the digital foundation that they're kind of, you know, using for their banking, now increasingly they can do it for record keeping, uh, you know, just everything. And soon more and more biology is, is I think, just going to be uh, incredibly beneficial. Like you're not going to put coal plants in, in, in Uganda, you're going to build solar farms. You know, you don't have to put in wires to run your internet. Uh, you're, you're just going to put up a Starlink antenna. And, and, you know, as everyone uses phones because it's their money, but now, you know, you give them a tablet, and you got more screen, it's basically your TV and everything. And that's good enough to do all your bioengineering. And as long as you've got a connection to great people to advise you and you're working on open projects and, you know, like now they can basically jump on the the state of the art synthetic biology bandwagon you know tomorrow <laughs> i love that and if the regulatory you know if they do their regulations right etc it's really going to accelerate yeah drew and i uh, drew andy and i didn't have time to talk about it but like the bio net and how interesting that is and that's coming you know um we'll have to get everybody together to talk about that but that fits in yeah. with the distributed model and biology gets more powerful as it scales down or vice versa yeah, um, I'm actually really, it gets more powerful as it scales down. It has to go down to that level. And, and other core things that are going to happen, like, right, we saw how incredibly cheap DNA sequencing got, like, like fast, like outpacing Moore's law. What most people don't realize is that we're going to see a very similar curve with DNA writing and with genome writing. And it's just, we're still up at that very high point where it's, you know, like if we were to write a human genome, we would literally a billion, be a billion or two dollars. We'd have to make the technology. We'd be building it. So it's very similar to where we were with DNA sequencing in, in 1990, you know, where it's, where it's literally a billion or more dollars to go do it. But, but it only took 20 years to go from, a, you know, a hundred, a hundred uh, million dollars to sequence a human. To, to today well under a thousand uh, at, at higher resolution and more interpretation than you could ever possibly have gotten back then. And again, DeepMind, Google DeepMind has already computationally protein folded every human protein. Like, holy crap, like this is amazing. And so that's 20 years. We're going to see DNA genome writing have similar price performance over the next 20 years. So it's it to me, it's totally within the realm of my thinking that we could build uh, uh, the genome of a, of a dog or a human in, in 20 years. Okay, it might take 25, but these are exponential technologies. I don't know, like, but I expect that the, we're gonna get parity and read write of DNA and our capabilities are gonna grow super exponentially. And I don't know where that leads because it's basically science fiction. Cells are the most powerful factories on the planet. And again, you plant a seed and you get a tree. We're, we're not good enough yet to program those seeds, but when we are, like, wow, um, okay. Uh, now, I'm, I'm, I've also become, a, as I've realized what's gonna happen and the incredible acceleration that could potentially happen, I also realized we're gonna run into some really strong headwinds because there's so many people that, that really fear any manipulation of their food or medicines or nature or, and, or contamination thereof 
or just playing God or even questioning God as, a, as an idea. Um, like all of this, it, it really comes down to we have to we have to realize we're becoming creators of life and 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 that comes with a certain responsibility and Stuart Brand I think put it best we we are as gods and we we need to get okay with this we need to get comfortable with this idea and and biology really drives that home so so I've become kind of a, a real advocate that these things biology when it gets on the forward edge a lot of it needs to be done in standardized places secure places transparent places and right now the only technologies that kind of drive that for me are these robotic labs and uh, and blockchains so you know the money and you know the processes everything's recorded so there's none of this there's none of the potential for corruption or manipulation. Uh, I think we need to have that as a baseline for building biology, or we go off into a really dark place, um, in, in my opinion, because it becomes more competitive. Well, genomes were the original blockchain, so. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, that's an amazing point, but yeah. And that's uh, one of the best takeaways, and something I always try to tell investors, you know, this is a, these are complicated spaces. It's only getting more complicated, but um, one thing that I found is, you know, if you can look to tools that are kind of borrowing as much as they can from nature, how does nature complete a task? You know, whether it's sequencing or synthesis, um, any company that's trying to replicate that or um, embody as much of that as possible uh, is probably going to have an edge in the market. You know, so like there's a, a something in a puddle right now, a single celled organism that can replicate its entire genome in like 20 minutes. Yeah. We can't make anywhere near that much DNA in 20 minutes maybe even days or today with today's technology. Um, so tools and technologies that, you know, like you said, that get better as they scale down. Uh, that's really interesting to me as an investor. It's one reason I actually really like Oxford Nanopore and Nanopore sequencing, yeah. right? I mean, their machines are very small and they're pretty good. They're getting better. They need to get better. But, you know, Illumina gets better by building bigger machines. They're like the size of a refrigerator, you know, Pack Bio too, pretty big boy. Um, nanopore though, I mean, you know, I mean, they already have things that can plug into your computer or your phone and even their, their flagship device that competes with the highest power devices from Illumina or PacBio. I mean, they're less than a foot tall. They sit on your desk. They're 70 pounds. The other ones are hundreds of pounds and like six feet tall. So yeah. that's that, just that, that one, um, observation, you know, what does biology do? How does it do it? It scales down. So find some of the tools that do that. And Nanopore kind of fits that that bill there, and when it comes to sequencing, anyway. Yeah, I I, I love nanopore. Just biochips in general. I, I've I have a whole thought process how carbon and silicon are are intersecting, and and it creates um, it creates a, a, a platform um, that is unparalleled. Like I think it's these these. It, 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 it's so exciting to me, but right now those two communities, uh, the semiconductor manufacturers and the folks that do biology at a molecular level, a nano level, those two groups have barely started to connect. And, and there's a few really brilliant people on the forefront of that, like Jonathan Rothberg, who created ion torrent and other, other technologies kind of at this molecular level. Um, I think we're gonna see a lot more of that. Because, you know, one of, for example, just a simple example, you can take just an array of electrodes, uh, which, you know, is incredibly small. And, and on each electrode, you can add either an aptamer, a short segment of DNA that's coded, uh, or an antibody. And now you've got an incredibly sensitive molecular detector. Uh, because anything that binds to any individual antibody in that, it's like a forest. Of, of little you know proteins if any molecule binds to any of those antibodies you get a signal and and like that's going to be the best virus detector we've ever made and it's cheap enough it costs a penny to manufacture at scale so i see like whole new markets for biosensing opening up because we're all going to have we have smoke detectors in our homes. We have carbon monoxide detectors. We have carbon dioxide detectors. And soon we're just going to have 
you know, every circulating molecule detector. You know, and at a core level, that's kind of how cells signal things molecularly. So it makes yeah, a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah, of course. We're just, we're, but we're going to fuse it. The problem with cells is they're squishy and wet and hard to control and they <laughs> divide and they want to go do their own thing. I want to be free. Um, and, and the nice thing is silicon is just, you know, it's so reliable, works over such a powerful range and, you know, it'll just work 24 seven, very low energy. I love that. So we're, we're, we're doing that, but, you know, we have to push this stuff. Uh, again, there's going to be so much resistance to doing this in the everyday world that I, what the way I've started to process is societally, we have to put a firewall in between the stuff that we're really experimenting with in the natural world, because we don't want things to mix and cross over. That just, if anything, it confuses the signal, contaminates nature, blah, blah, blah. I think we need to start really working in much more secure labs than we have today, because even the most secure labs that we had or thought we had leaked pathogens doesn't have good control. And I'm not talking Wuhan here. I'm just talking American labs where anthrax got out or they lose track of where their smallpox samples are, et cetera. <laughs> you know, like, so, so, you know, and no one's perfect, I, I, but we should strive for more perfection. And, and, and again, once an organism is in a database, you can't delete it. Someone's copied that sequence somewhere. So, so we need much more, we need to think security, biosecurity in new ways and kind of COVID has prompted that moving forward, but, but we're still playing way too many stupid political and economic games. And, but, you know, this is a trainer pandemic. I get it. And, and we've paid, we're paying a heavy price for the lessons. But, but we're going to get better. If government can't do it, industry will, because even, you know, we, people want to live. They don't want to be sick. You know, we're going to, we're going to fix this moving forward. But, you know, like the, we're, we're going to get some pushback. So I think we need that isolation. And I think that the, the place to really drive it forward, which is already isolated, is aerospace. Because I love the International Space Station. And, and again, you know, Oxford Nanopore brought the first sequencer up to the International Space Station because it was the size of a cell phone or smaller, not the big wet aluminum machines. It's because they've made it a chip. Uh, so, so that's great. When they do the first DNA synthesis in space, I think it'll be pretty cool too. When they, when they teleport an organism by sending a file to the space station and they print up that organism, or that medicine, that's a big one. So that, that being able to, you know, biologically fax is, or teleport as, as Craig Venter calls it, is, is really crucial. And we can demonstrate it here on earth. We have, the COVID was teleported from China to, to Switzerland, ETH, in, and it took six weeks. Uh, okay, let's make that six minutes. Let's make it, well, let's make it six days and six hours and six minutes. You know, like, let's, let's figure out that. So that's going to be really important. So I think the aerospace and SynBio, I think, are going to create a baby that is going to be really powerful because you're working inside a level four containment lab and you need, you're in a hyper extreme environment where you have to control and regulate everything, the air you breathe, the water, you know, and how it's filtered, waste management, so you're not just throwing poop out, you know, on the moon or Mars or in the <laughs> orbit, because poop traveling at 17,000 miles per hour is a weapon. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, a, it, it's flinging shit faster than a monkey ever could. And, and, and you know, uh, so, I think, so I think aerospace is really going to drive this forward, and I love the idea. And so, um, and I, 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 I touch on this in the book, but, but I think that we're going to have to start prototyping colonies here on earth that are, that like we want to put in orbit or on the moon and Mars. And, and I, think it, I think the sweet spot is around 100 and 150 people and being able to sustain that with abundance. You know, like you have to bleed off the excess oxygen, not even do that. <laughs> but 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 you know like where you have more than enough food the environment is is healthy um you know like you're not <gasps> gasping for breath co2 levels are rising we're all gonna die no like no, like we really do it with abundance and i think that prototyping here on earth which can be done everywhere i think is going to be really one of the big grand challenges for humanity this you know over the next few decades because we're going to space uh, that's fun 
but but we have to be able to live there yeah it makes a lot of sense too right um we're gonna bring all this food and all this other stuff with us to mars or the moon or we're we just gonna send the signal to grow it up and print it out ourselves once we're there or yeah. vice versa if we find life on mars you know well yeah that, we're gonna, it, have to, we're gonna have to, wait, get a robot and ship it into space and send it back it'll take years or we can yeah. sequence it on mars and then send the signal back and boot it up here that would take assuming time. it's built on similar architecture and i i'm gonna wager that it is like i i i'm pretty confident be, just because it's so universal here on earth this low level architecture of the cell uh i i think I'm pretty confident that we're going to find similar microbes, you know, based on this architecture in in our local solar system. I can't wait, but that's one of the biggest reasons to go build starships and go and start exploring. Like I want, I want to know how if life is works in these other extremes environments too, and I want to study it. I want its, I want its code base. <laughs> Talk about bioprospecting on other planets. That would be cool that that is going to be one of the coolest jobs ever yeah well i know you have a hard stop here coming up um but uh if you want to tease out though you you're, you've t mentioned it before you, you just wrote a book we can't really say much yeah. about it now but uh what can you say about it uh, well i can i can show you the cover of the advanced reader copy it's called the genesis machine i wrote it our quest to rewrite life in the age of synthetic biology so um and i wrote it with the amazing amy webb who is, unlike me, a multiple New York Times bestselling author. And, and I, love, I love the humanity and voice that, that Amy brings to this. I'm a geek and, and I, can, uh, I, I can't go as technical as some of my colleagues, but I can't write stories as well as Amy. And I am delighted by this, this collaboration. So this comes out in February. Um, it covers some of the stuff here and 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 other stuff but um i think it's i think it's a really good introduction to these technologies that's accessible to just about anyone awesome well, i've been reading through the uh, unedited copy and i like what i see so far i like how you guys organize it but uh, i'd love to have you both of you back you and amy uh, maybe closer to to the book launch if we can arrange that totally totally uh can make that happen awesome we'll That'd learn out so more. much fun Hey, thanks a lot for joining me. You're, like I said, you're so valuable here because you're, you know, everyone's squabbling at the, uh, the line of scrimmage and you're launching the ball 60 yards downfield. So uh, <laughs> I, uh, I get to play. You know, like I don't have the, I don't have the challenges of running a large lab or company and, and I want to keep it that way. But I have been working with a remarkable new group um, that's forming now. You'll hear more about it probably in the next podcast that at the core of it is a biofoundry wrapped around it is just some of the biggest brains in business and and i think it's going to become a really powerful uh, resource for um for people wanting to start programming living things so i i have uh they've given me a title of chief exploration officer um <laughs> and my whole job is just literally play on the fringe uh and start connecting you know stuff back to the core so, and, and exploring new ways of doing things. We have to, we kind of have to rethink all of biotech, in my opinion, because these technologies are so powerful. It's, we're moving from typewriters and, and pencils to, you know, to the most advanced, uh, you know, AI word processing systems. And, and, and I think that's, um, yeah, it's an exciting challenge, but you, you kind of have to start from scratch in your thinking. Well, you're the perfect person for that job so uh i look forward to hearing more and uh, we'll have you back cool thank you so much max this was total fun all right